the stunning band website in minutes with Bandzoogle. Go to Bandzoogle.com to start your free 30-day trial and use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Michael Branvold, and as always, joined by Jay Gilbert. Jay, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm pretty excited. It's it's Thursday. We got the Vikings playing tonight. Thursday night football. And yeah, Thursday night football. Are you ready? And uh, we've got a really great guest today. Yeah, before we get to the guest, let me just throw out a little bit of our housekeeping. Of course, thank you so much to HypeBot and to Bands in Town for everything you do to support the podcast, everything you do to promote the podcast. It means so much to us. And, of course, today's prod- podcast is brought to you by Band Zoogle, which, by the way, congrats, Dave Cool on the Dave new Cool promoted to vice president of business development. I way think. to go, Dave. Yeah, congrats. Um, from garage bands to Grammy winners, Band Zoogle powers the websites for thousands of musicians around the world. Their simple step-by-step system will get you online in minutes. Choose from dozens of mobile-friendly templates, then customize your design and content in just a few clicks. Built for musicians by musicians, Bandzoogle has all the features you need for your website and EPK already built in, including a merch and download store to sell music and merch commission-free, tour calendar to promote your shows and sell your own tickets commission-free, a new fan club option, a new crowdfunding option, um, crowdfunding commission-free, by the way, uh, mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send professional newsletters, integrations to pull in your content from all your online services, including Twitter, YouTube, and SoundCloud, and, of course, live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Yeah. Plans start at just $8.29 a month, which includes hosting and your own free custom domain name. Go to bandzoogle.com to start your 30-day free trial, and be sure to use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY, all one word, MUSICBIZWEEKLY, and you'll get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's bandzoogle.com, promo code Music Biz Weekly to build your website and EPK today. They're great, and, by the way, Michael. Yeah. I'm launching in the next week or so my first site built. I've I'm working on like three of them with Banzoogle, but the first one that's going live will be probably next week, and I'll let you know. But they it looks beautiful, yeah. crazy functionality, and like you were saying, it's built by musicians. So if you're building a website for musicians. It works. Yeah, it's the the tools are designed exactly for you. You don't have That's to take right. some another tool <laughs> that just works in general and go, well, okay, let me shoehorn it in and make it work for <laughs> right. music or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, also want to thank uh, DiscMakers.com for bringing you this week's episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. We know it's a digital world, but there's still an important role for physical media in for for physical media for today's independent musician. Digital royalty payments are so small that selling products like CD, vinyl, T-shirts at gigs has become an important income generator. For every CD you sell at a gig, you'd need roughly 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money. That's a lot of streams. Our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your discs and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even T-shirts. And they've got a very cool USB drive that's a cassette tape. I love that. It's a cassette tape that there's no real tape in it. You don't no, need a cassette. A you don't need a cassette player. It's just yeah. the shell, and on the bottom where normally be the tape, a USB drive pops out. So. Sort of a cool way to keep the cassette feel alive, but you don't have to worry about yeah, pulling cool. out your pencil to rewind the tape when it gets jammed in the, the tape player. Um, uh, so head over to discmakers.com. You'll get free shipping on CD orders of a hundred do- of a hundred or more from Disc Makers if you use the code Free Biz. All one word, free biz. Put that code in when you check out at discmakers.com. You'll get free shipping on CD orders of 100 or more from Disc Makers. Hurry, the code expires 12 19 
head over to discmakers.com. So, today's killer special guest. Yeah, I mean, we, we, so uh, much great information. You know, we're, we're, yeah. we've already done the interview, so we Jay and I already know what's coming. At, that's but, right. That's but, right. Um, amazing information about yeah. some big things that will impact pretty much all musicians out there. Yeah, at all I mean, levels. The Music Modernization Act. Mm-hmm. The, the case the, act, the, the case act, which was just brand new. Yeah, um, just got yeah, yeah. So we've got Rachel Stillwell, uh, a lawyer, who's going to sit down with us and give us a very low, low level. What does it mean to you? What what are these acts? Yeah, what you don't have to be an attorney to understand what she's 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 making it so us knuckleheads can understand yeah, it. Yeah, what are you going to have to do, and what are you going to get out of this, and and what's the downside of this? So, yeah. um, definitely give this a listen. You're going to learn something, and it's something you're going to need to know. I guarantee it. Today we have Rachel Stillwell, uh, legal services for musicians, producers, film and TV, basically all types of uh, folks in the creative process. And uh, Rachel was recently named by Billboard as one of its 2019 top music lawyers. Congratulations. Congrats. Thank you. Rachel, thanks for joining us today. What a pleasure. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, we have, I mean, millions and millions of questions, but I, I know that there's a couple of things that are on a lot of folks' minds um, lately. Um, and one of the things that uh, we get asked about quite a bit, and we've talked a little bit about on the show, is kind of the the progression of, uh, or the evolution of kind of the Music Modernization Act. And I know that you've been involved in that. Um, can you speak a little bit for those who don't really know what it's all about, um, what it is and, and how you're involved? Sure. Uh, so the Music Modernization Act, which will go into effect January 1st of 2021, uh, is a collection of laws governing music licensing. Um, both musical compositions and sound recordings. And um, and it's what they call a consensus bill. It got bipartisan support and, uh, and, and passed through the House and Senate without any objection from anybody on either side of the aisle. Uh, in order to do that, you've got to have a lot of compromise. And so, um, so this is a compromise bill. Uh, digital service providers got some things out of it. And certainly those of us in the uh, music creator community got some things out of it. Um, and overall, it changes the way that musical compositions are licensed to digital service providers that provide either interactive streaming or digital downloads. Um, it also, and that's on the musical composition side, um, it also federalizes protection for sound recordings that were made before 1972, which mm-hmm. up until this point hadn't been protected by federal law wow. for really arbitrary, stupid reasons. Um, and now they will be. <laughs> um, and finally, it, it simplifies and codifies how uh, those of us in the Recording Academy called p and wingers, uh, producers. What's that? Who- uh, p e Wing is the producers and engineers wing of the Recording Academy. And so it's producers, engineers, mixers, mastering engineers, um, those type of technical people that I, I represent on legal matters, but I don't really understand exactly what they do with their little electronic boards and whatnot. Sure. So um, anyway, they uh, sometimes they negotiate to get points on uh, or a percentage of net profits on uh, on sound recordings that they work on. But because sound recordings change hands and get gobbled up uh, by varying uh, record companies or media companies, uh, sometimes it can be hard to chase those dollars down. And this simplifies for them how they go about doing that. Wow. So, so for the... The DIY artist who's out there, which is a lot of our listeners, how is this going to impact them? Will they see something different? Is something going to change for them? Yes. Um, I think it's going to be easier for them to collect royalties 
from digital service providers in particular. Uh, so part of the deal with the MMA is that there's going to be a music licensing collective that is created whose job it is to figure out who needs to get paid, which, which indie songwriters and which music publishers that, ha that have rights to administer uh, musical compositions, they're going to be there to match up who needs to get paid with the royalties that are paid. So before the MMA, there was a compulsory, co compulsory licensing scheme in place or law in place whereby if you're Spotify or Apple Music, um, you have to license each and every musical composition that you use on an individual basis. And you can do it using a, what's called a compulsory license without even without the permission of the person who owns the recording, but you have to at least give them notice that, hey, I'm gonna use your recording and, uh, and I'm gonna pay royalties for that. Uh, but sometimes um, in the past, certain DSP, certain DSPs like Spotify have done a really bad job of finding those people who administer these rights. And they say, oh, golly, we can't find you like Eminem. So <laughs> we're, so we're not going to pay you. Uh, if we can't find you, we can't pay you. Well, let, let, let me real quick there, because I'm trying to, I, I was at the West Coast Songwriters Conference um, a couple months ago, and there were some lawyers talking about the Music Modernization Act. And, yeah. and this is what they were talking about. And correct me if I'm wrong, because this is all, it's somewhat complicated. Um, at the way it used to be, would those royalties get thrown into some holding pool that that Spotify created, but nobody ever did much to actually track down who the people were to pay the money? Or did the money just um, go nowhere and went into, into the DSP's profits? So, uh, well, to the best of my knowledge, the money never went anywhere. Um, the idea was they had to send in these notices of intent to the copyright office under the claim, and perhaps arduous claim, that, uh, that they can't find these administrators or, or it, either independent or non-independent uh, songwriters. Um, and then it would be the burden of the songwriter to, or the, or the entity that was administering those rights to, to somehow claim their royalties when that's not the business that they're in. They're in the it business. sounds a little unreasonable yeah, it's, to it's me. Like, it's like the artist I mean, has to become a private investigator and go out right. and find the people who owe them money versus the people right. who owe them money finding that client. So this this collective that you're talking about, yeah. who, who would pay into it? Would it be Sound Exchange or the PROs or where does that money kind of funnel? How does that work to you? Uh, that money comes from the digital service providers. Oh, okay. So, um, so their incentive for, for helping, so not only do they have to pay the royalties that they're supposed to pay anyway, but they're also funding the creation and existence and maintenance of the music Love licensing that. collective. Gotcha. Why do they do that voluntarily? Uh, they, they are complaining already about the costs <laughs> of doing it, but, sure. but what do they get out of it? Not being sued. So, uh, so under this prior scheme where, you know, Spotify, some argue was abusing the process of sending these notice of notices of intent to the copyright office claiming that they can't find the people to pay royalties, uh, they were, you know, they were subject to several class action lawsuits um, on this and, uh, and had to gotcha. do big settlements. So now... Uh, they will be without liability for infringement. I see. Like they were in these in these prior in these prior lawsuits, so long as they pay royalties not only on the use of musical compositions 
that that the rights holders can be found for, but for every song that they use. So, 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 so all of those songs that they couldn't find, maybe legitimately couldn't find that person, right. Right. they still have to pull that royalty pennies or what dollars, whatever it might be, they have to pull it out of their financial stream yes. and, and put it somewhere to this collective to be, to be exactly. claimed at some point in the future. And it could sit there forever if nobody is tracked down, I'm assuming, right? Well, sort of. But um, they're not taking it as profit. No, they're certainly not taking it as profit. Um, so that the, uh, the answer to that is twofold, and I'll try to remember both part one and part two. <laughs> so um, so the, so the music will, I'm sorry, the, the money will go into the music licensing collective and the music licensing collective is going to create a database that is part of their mandate or mission that matches up writers and publishers with their royalties. And if, and, um, and if they can't figure it out, who owns the rights to administer these musical compositions and get paid these royalties, um, they they will put on that website, hey, we need to know who's claiming this song. And so this is going to put a, somewhat of a burden on rights holders, including independent songwriters, to claim their work, to claim their songs with the Music Licensing Collective. And because of that, there's their... Um, there were some critics that said, oh, well, putting this burden on songwriters is, is too much for them. They're songwriters. They shouldn't have to do this. But from what I understand, the actual burdens of doing this are going to be pretty minimal. So as, yeah. as owners of intellectual property, right, there are plenty of times when songwriters or people who create their own sound recordings, um, are tasked with doing sort of basic administrative stuff to protect their work, like registering it with the copyright office, right? That's a DIY process that costs $35 or less or something like that, and um, and most people can do on their own. This is gonna be easier than that. So if you want your money, you just gotta go on there, you know, when it's created and say, oh, that's my song, I want my money. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, so, so they're going to be in the in the business of matching up people with their royalties, and if for some reason they can't figure it out, then there is an affirmative sort of low-level burden. It shouldn't be too hard yeah. to, for independent uh, music creators, songwriters. Yeah. If, that doesn't sound too onerous to me. I mean, if, they, if this collective creates, whether it's a website or a queryable database or whatever that manifests itself, if they create this thing... That's one stop shopping that you yes. know that you can kind of go in and it sure is better than the alternative, right? I mean, it's better than it was. That's certainly true. And some of the same criticisms that were leveled at Sound Exchange as they were forming, um, you know, uh, about, you know, how, how are they going to, how are they going to handle this? And is the burden going to be, you know, too big on owners of sound recordings? Uh, that turned out pretty well. Sure. Um, so this is going to be analogous to that. There's a you know there's a mix of people on the board between music publishers and independent songwriters. Um, that was a little fight that happened um, during the, during the process, but I'm pleased to say that I, I think it's um, four slots on that board are given to independent songwriters. Um, oh, okay. And like eight for publishers, um, but there will be voice. There, there will be voices for independent songwriters on there. Now, what happens to the royalties that are in there that just are never claimed for whatever reason? Will is there is there a window where they eventually revert back to the DSPs? What happens? They don't revert back to the DSPs. They. That's what uh, if you're if you're in a googling mood, that's what people refer to as black box money yeah. um, on here. And yeah. my understanding is that um, the MLC is going to do everything that they can to really minimize that uh, that amount of money. But whatever 
black box money that there is, my understanding is it's it's distributed to music publishers on a um, on a market share basis. Gotcha. So, so the so the downside for that is well, if you're an independent if you're if you're an independent songwriter, it's going to be hard for you to see that black box money, which means you really need to be on your game as an individual for claiming your royalties. Yeah. And is, is there a time frame for how long you have to go in there to claim before yeah. you lose that option? There is. Uh, I can't remember what it is, though. Okay. Okay. It's two days. Two- <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that that's super interesting. Um, and, I, you know, if some of these groups like Neris or, you know, the, the music tech press and kind of get the word out for folks to let them know that this is how it's working – you know, it, it seems like it's a pretty good system, um, you know, at least on paper. Yeah. So um, I think so. I think it's a huge improvement. You know, the money is going to get to the songwriter community and to the music publisher community instead of just sit around in the coffers of the digital ser- service providers. Um, cool. and, and everything's going to be far more transparent. Yeah. Are there Are there any downsides, anything coming out of this that, are not something that the artists and the ind- independent songwriters would be in favor of that was part of a compromise? Is there, is there the, a downside to this? Uh, yeah, two, uh, two potential downsides. One is um, the digital service providers can no longer be sued so long as they are complying with the law here, meaning paying royalties. Um, so I, you know, I don't know under what circumstances they they they, yeah. they should get sued if they're paying everything that they're supposed to pay. But the, but there have been questions about you know how much do we want to let these digital service providers off the hook? And then the other is the black box money, and that you know if it's being distributed by market share, um, you know, yeah, that's that's, that's, that's going to adversely some. affect the indies maybe a little bit. Right. Um, I wonder if there's, you know, if there is a conflict, um, if there's arbitration or some some means in which you can address that, or is it just, you know, you take it or leave it? Uh, um, it's set up by statute, um, so I think whatever it is, it is, but. The, but the two things that are mitigating that are that the Music Licensing Collective, which is comprised of good people who are trying to do the right thing, um, have every intention of minimizing the amount of black box money that there is. Um, gotcha. And uh, I had a second thought, brain fart, it's gone. <laughs> That's all right. Well, a, a cu- couple questions that I'm sure indie artists are going to want to know is what do they have to do? Is there anything they have to do now? Or is there anything that artists need to do at a set date or buy a yeah, certain... Is there any kind of registration? Yeah, do they have or... to get themselves registered in the Music yeah, um... Modernization Act? I mean, what what are the, what's on their shoulders? Um, they will need to register with the Music Licensing Collective. Um, they're going to create a database and a website that's supposed to be easy to use. It hasn't been created yet. They're, you know, they're still in the formulative stages, which is why this all goes into effect in 2021. They need some time to gear up. Sure. So, so the Music Licensing Collective will um, make it easy for people to sync up with them and, and claim their rights. And um, and they're going to be working actively with publishers to put a database together that is pretty well populated before, um, you know, even before indie songwriters need to pipe up and say, OK, I'm claiming this song and this song and this song. You know, but, um, uh, you know, it's talking about, you know, the burdens of song songwriters. Yeah. Uh, earlier, not only you know, sh- not only should you, and if you haven't, please register your musical compositions with the copyright office. But they also have a burden too of they register with ASCAP, they register with with BMO. Sure. This is going to be certainly no harder than that. Yeah. 
it just needs to be part of the process for them going forward. Um, yeah. N- n- okay. Another, n- another question, and maybe it's way too early to even know what the answer is, but can <clears throat> the artists expect to be paid more from these DSPs now because this is happening? Or at the end of the day, is their royalty check for Spotify streaming going to be the same as it was beforehand? No, I, I think it is going to increase. Um, so part of what's going on with the MMA isn't just restructuring how royalties get paid and not allowing the DSPs to claim for whatever reason that they can't find somebody so that they're not going to pay them. But also the um, rate court, uh, so, so the rate setting procedures are also going to be affected in a way that stops what the music community thinks is a rate suppressing uh, pr- procedure that's in place right now. So um, so royalty rates um, for musical compositions in this digital arena are set by a copyright royalty board. Um, and right now, the copyright royalty board is not allowed, for example, to consider rates in other fields like sound recordings when determining what's fair uh, to, or what's appropriate um, to pay music publishers and songwriters. So now there's going to be a willing willing buyer, willing seller standard that is expected to in, you know, increase the actual royalty amounts. And, and when it comes to rate setting procedures, right now, <coughs> ASCAP, and BMI each have one judge in the um, in federal court in New York that decides all of the rate matters for each of those uh, performing performing rights organizations, and so uh, nothing new gets done because it's the same judge over and over and over. So sure. now. Under the MMA, they're going to change it to this wheel uh, wheel analogy, where judges are going to rotate in for each of these rate court rate setting procedures, um, so that you get fresh eyes and fresh yeah, ears, fresh blood in there. Exactly, and um, and so it's expected within the publisher and songwriter community that this will help increased rates over time. Okay. So when you say DSPs, and for those who don't know, you know, digital service providers like Spotify, Pandora, Deezer, it, does YouTube play into that as well? And when I say YouTube, I'm talking about, you know, uh, on the video side, not their audio streaming platform. Do you um, know if they pay into that or is that separate? That's separate. Um, so they're the worst offenders um, of underpaying for sure. the use of sound recordings and musical compositions. Without a doubt. Uh, but, uh, you know what, that's a really good question. And uh, frankly, I can't, I can't remember. So yeah, that's all right. I, 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 I would be really curious to know why or what happened to keep them separate from all of the others. I mean, was it... Was it pure lobbying muscle that they had to get themselves <laughs> excluded from this? Um, they've always had. Um, so frankly, it doesn't come across my desk a lot, right? Because people don't pay lawyers to uh, to try to figure out why why is YouTube doing such a bad job of compensating music yeah. creators. Um, but my my understanding is that it's always been separate valuations and a separate licensing scheme. Um, and so this particular, uh, you know, the, the licensing scheme that is covered by the MMA deals with two particular code sections of the copyright law. And, um, and I think that YouTube falls in a in a different section. All right. Sections All 115 right. and 115. Well, 
there, there's another i mean this this music modernization act is just um it just fascinates me, especially when you talk about the pre-1972 stuff. Um, I, some of these things, I'm actually kind of, as a you know layman, I'm I'm kind of surprised that some of this hasn't been addressed before now. But um, let's let's move forward a little bit to a, another uh, case uh, that just passed the U.S. House of Representatives, and that's the Case Act. Yeah. Um, we, we've been hearing a lot about this lately. And I'm trying to kind of, you know, I've been reading through it and trying to make uh, sense of all of this. Um, can you kind of give us, a, a, you know, a broad overview of the Case Act and kind of what your thoughts are on on what's going on there? Sure. Uh, well, I think it's really good news. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, it it, it in, has enjoyed bipartisan support. It got through. Uh, it sailed through the Judiciary Committees for both the House and the Senate really quickly. Um, unanimously or close to it, and um, and just in the last couple of days, um, passed the floor vote of the House of Representatives, 410 to six. So oh, at overwhelmingly, a time, at a time when lawmakers cannot agree on anything, they can agree. Right. Yes, this makes sense. Good point. So, um, so it's just really smart. It's um, so the Case Act will create a small claims court for copyright matters. Um, Sounds a little bit like the Music Modernization Act in a sense that you're creating this kind of, you know, separate little group that will help us all get along. Well, uh, <laughs> on a much, much smaller scale. So, yeah. yes, we're going to we're going to have smart people who know something about copyright, which doesn't always happen in federal court. Um, uh, deciding infringement cases where where those who own could be sound recordings, could be musical compositions, could be photographs, could be a script, uh, anything that's copyrightable. So it's not just for the community, music community. Um, uh, owners of copyrights will now be able to protect their work without having to litigate in federal court, which is um, which is very expensive. Yeah. So um, I've heard varying. I've heard about different studies saying that the average cost of litigation in federal court for copyright for infringement is either a quarter million dollars or close to four hundred thousand dollars. In any case, wow, wow, uh, the money that normal people don't have, right? No. Right. If you're the, Disney, the, the, yeah, you so, can do it. So, but so if the, you're me as a, having a photography business, yep. I'm not going to go and, in and, there and, and fight. An indie artist is never, even though they have every right and probably could win, they're just not going to go do it because they're going to get they're going to get blown out because they don't have the money. Exactly. So uh, that's often referred to as a right without a remedy. You've got a right, but you can't enforce it because you can't yeah. afford to. Makes um, sense. So. Um, Anyway, so that has always stunk um, for copyright owners that are not huge corporations with unlimited resources. Um, so now there's going to be um, one copyright tribunal in Washington, D.C., um, where a copyright owner can file an action and claim that they have been infringed and they can and they can claim for for one work that's been infringed up to to fifteen thousand dollars, and collectively for all of the works infringed, whether it's two or forty, uh, up to thirty thousand dollars total. Um, and that's very different than the damages that you can get in federal court, where. Uh, the statutory damages are up to $150,000 per work infringed with no aggregate cap right. on, gotcha. on, on the amount. Um, and, um, and so the downside, of course, of being in a small claims court instead of federal court is if you've got a work that was infringed and your actual damages are sixty thousand dollars, the most you're going to get is thirty. But it's a lot better than the nothing that you would have gotten because you couldn't afford to litigate in regular federal court. 
Right. You know, and I was reading about it a little bit and they were saying that the ACLU is against it because they think that, you know, people could, you know, get fined for sharing a meme or or something frivolous like that. I'm not sure I, I agree with that, but the, and also the Electronic Frontier Foundation is against it, too. Uh, why would someone be against this? Because it seems to make a lot of sense if you're not you know, one of the big uh, intellectual property owners that can afford to take this, you know, all the way. Right. Well, I certainly can't speak for the ACLU, um, although I usually agree with uh, a lot that they do. In this particular instance, uh, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know why they're taking the position that they're taking, but it doesn't seem very well informed because uh, defendants in this new copyright small claims court can opt out. They they so um, so while in normal court, if you are a defendant, you are compelled to be there and stay there until it's until the matter is decided. In this small claims court, though, uh, if you are a defendant, or in this case they call it a respondent, um, you can say you can elect to not participate in the proceedings. And then it goes away as if you had never been sued in the first place. So, so some people will naturally say, well, why would anybody subject themselves as a respondent or a defendant in a, in a case like this? And the answer is, if you know ahead of time that the worst that can happen is that you're going to get hit for a maximum of $15,000 for the work that is infringed, then then you might want to just go ahead and settle it in order to either absolve yourself from liability and mm -hmm. and say no I'm not liable for this um, or to or to reduce or mitigate your damages um, because the federal court option is always still there and and you might get hit for much larger um, damages there. Yeah. Is, is this something where if somebody started in the small claims court and didn't get the ruling they wanted, can they take it to the federal court if they had the funds? Or is it one, one time done regardless of the court? It's, it's non-appealable. Um, okay. Okay. Um, I lost my train of thought there for a second. I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much coming in here. I mean, this is such important stuff. I mean, it seems right. so well, so basic, but there's always, you know, there's always, you know, the devil is in the details with this stuff. And I think the part that I don't understand is, you know, let, I'm a photographer and I see my work everywhere um, that isn't approved. And for me, since it's not my primary business and I don't have the time or the energy to track that stuff down and the fact that it's whack-a-mole, you know, yeah. but I, I see people making t-shirts and even shoes. And uh, in fact, on my wall in my office, I have a big lithograph of somebody had like made paintings of one of my uh, photographs. Yes. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm the anomaly. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go after that. Right. But I guess my concern would be is, and correct me if I'm wrong in this assumption, if I did go to this tribunal, small claims, whatever you're, you're calling this for, for this, and I go against somebody who's making these products, if they just don't respond and don't show up, then it's dismissed. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it, it goes away out of the, um, if, if they don't subject to jurisdiction, then, then the whole case goes away. That seems a wow. little, I don't know, that seems a little odd or wrong to me that if as a copyright holder, I want to make a claim that you've infringed on my copyright, but that person ignores it and doesn't show up, the whole case goes away and you get no remedy for it then. And you can't re-prosecute -pro it. <laughs> Clearly, I've studied law. <laughs> um, I know that it, so... I know that it's not appealable. Once at, there's a ruling. Um, once there's a ruling, um, 
if I if I had my druthers, I would have like a break and double check about whether before whether it's dismissed, whether it's dismissed with prejudice or without, and and whether then you could still take it to the federal court. I'm not so sure of myself on that one. It it, it just seems to me that if that's the way it operates, everybody who's being brought up for copyright infringement is just going to ignore it because it just goes away and they won't have unless they're a legit company that doesn't want you know this PR yeah bad PR to drag down their stock price or could come back to bite them uh, later any form of litigation is is usually going to wind up in some kind of settlement um So, so whether you're whether you're litigating in state court, federal court, um, small claims court, generally, if there's somebody who thinks that they're going to wind up with an adverse judgment, they're going to come to you and say, "Why don't we work something out on the side and dismiss this case?" Yeah. And so, and can you always do that, Rachel? Like, like if I'm engaged with somebody who's violated my copyright, at any point in the process, can I just say time out, and that person says, "Look." I don't want to go through this process. I'm going to give you ten grand, and let's just call this a day. Can you just do do that at any time? Yeah. Any time. Okay. Any any time. So um, you know, and you can and you can haggle on what the number is, but um, but often it's going to be in the interest of the person who has been alleged to infringe to settle for far less than they would actually be made to pay in a in an adverse judgment against them so you work a lot with i would imagine artists labels managers um all sorts of creative people so in in your business is this a big part of your your business copyright infringement or is it just one of the necessary kind of evils of you know being in this business um some well, I am a transactional attorney, so I'm I'm. What is, I'm sorry. What does that mean? I'm for us. Sure, sure. Okay, so transactional attorney is one that is a deal maker that negotiates and drafts deals and puts them together. And, oh, okay. And so I make sure that my clients max out whatever they can get financially on their deal and that their intellectual property is protected. Um, and Great. so it's a lot of stuff on paper, a lot of contracts. Uh, a litigator, on the other hand, is somebody that goes to court all the time and gotcha. sued and gets sued. So, um, so the copyright infringement world, um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're litigating, that's expensive right now, it'll be less so by far, uh, when, um, with the case act, if you're, if you're using the, the copyright small claims court, um, but but it's not generally something. It's not generally a place where transactional attorneys are going to go. I try to keep my clients out of court in the first place. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the best that's a good advice. strategy. So you know, so so what I'm trying to do is, if there's a dispute with somebody, work it out. Um, you know, get them to take it down. If that's not sufficient, okay, let's talk about damages. Let's talk about um, a fair licensing. Uh, scheme where there's money that changes hands so that okay maybe you didn't have a license to begin with but you need one let's set that let's set that up let's let's come to an agreement now even though you're already infringing so there are other recourses um other than court uh to you know to work this out and and some infringers are worse than others right so some people know what they're doing they're stealing it they're copying it they're creating lithographs um and other people might be accidental right they just didn't know they just didn't know any better. Yeah. Um, so the, you know, so those things happen. But um, you know, but coming back to the case act um, and this and the small claims tribunal, you know, the 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 reason why it's cheaper is that lawyers don't matter. You don't need a lawyer to go to small claims court. Um, so the biggest expense. In do, federal- do you do you actually have to? physically attend yourself or is this something that can be done all through filing paperwork and some judge reads yeah. both sides makes a ruling and that's, emails you the results i couldn't have said it better myself there might be <laughs> um like you know skype sessions like this or zoom or or phone calls or or 
whatever so that people can uh, communicate, but you don't physically have to go there. So, so, ah. the, so the biggest expenses associated with federal courts, namely high attorney's fees yeah. and having to go to where physically be there as jurisdiction um, is now not an issue. And it's expedited. It's pretty quick. It's done mostly on the basis of documents. You don't have to show up physically and you don't have to have a lawyer. And wow. something, something else that's nice about this is, so in this particular tribunal, the, the adjudicators, the people who are deciding these cases are actually going to know something about copyright law. So copyright law is under the original jurisdiction of federal courts, meaning uh, meaning it's the only place that you can go um, to have these cases litigated uh, until now, anyway. Um, but, but copyright infringement cases are relatively rare, and so there aren't many judges on federal courts with a lot of practice in understanding copyright law. So no wonder that recently we've had a, you know, a few copyright infringement cases that have come out with controversial verdicts sure. and tough calls, you know? So here you're going to have experts in copyright law actually deciding the cases. Um, <laughs> and so you're not crazy. Really you should get better results. Right. Rachel, back, back to the, the concept that the whole case could be dismissed if the, if the infringer doesn't respond, why wouldn't they have written the act the other way that if, the person being accused of infringing ignores it, doesn't respond, the default judgment goes in favor of the copyright holder. You know, basically, you don't show up to court to defend yourself, you're guilty. Um, I don't know. I didn't write it. Um. <laughs> it's, it just seems to me that would be the, I don't know, the better way to do it rather than, because now you're penalizing the copyright holder basically saying, sorry, you're not going to get a chance to defend this, and this person's going to keep abusing it unless you can get a lawyer now and take it to federal court. Yeah, and you've also got something on the record, though. I was thinking about that when we were talking through this, that you've also now got a, a paper trail and a pattern of behavior um, if more than one person it can, you know, is complaining about this same infringer, for example. Or, I mean, you've kind of got it now on the public record, and I can see some value you know, in that as well, whether at some point you join forces and there's some sort of class action or you know, some larger play against the uh, infringer. But I know what you mean, Michael. I mean, I was thinking about it in terms of you know, my photography if i went and complained well this guy is selling t-shirts on facebook with my images on it and he just doesn't show up then that's the end of it but on the other hand i didn't have to pay an attorney right um i just went right. into this thing and filled out some forms so yeah it's it's interesting well uh, what's also interesting is that the criticisms of the case act are are instead Claiming like the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation. Yes, no, Frontier yeah. Foundation. Um, so EFF, um, which hates everything having to do with copyright and thinks that copyright should just plain be eliminated, um, you Make know, it, shut up. It is it is is making it sound as if this is going to be really onerous on real people that just want to do a meme. Um, and, and in, you know, and in fact, freedom of speech, right. Yeah. Um, like cop as if copyright has no value and, and there's just no basis for believing that if, if, if a defendant can just say, no, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not going to participate in this process. Information needs to be free, Rachel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So um, be before we run out of time here, I really wanted to make sure we touched on uh, Music First Coalition. Um, it, that sounded really interesting. Tell me a little bit about Music First. Sure. Uh, so Music First is a music advocacy group um, that is comprised of uh, some all kinds of stakeholders in sound recordings. So 
the Recording Academy, the Latin Recording Academy, the RIAA, A2IM, oh, wow. uh, AF, AFM, SAG-AFTRA. Um, the Dream Team. And uh, so representing both big conglomerates and sole proprietors um, in the sound recording industry. And basically, they've been advocating for many years for the creation of a right to performance royalties for the use of sound recordings at AMFM, which is uh, which is something that is, according to the music community, long overdue. Mm -hmm. um, AMFM radio. Because that's in the U.S., right? Isn't it already in place in other territories? It is. In, in just about every other developed country in the world except for the United States. Okay. So we are one of very few countries along with North Korea and Iran and Rwanda who don't pay who don't pay royalties for the use of sound recordings. And um, and if that were rectified and along with Sirius XM and uh, and Pandora and Spotify and everybody else, they did have to pay uh, royalties. Then those royalties would be split 50-50 between recording artists and owners of the copyrights and the sound recordings. So record labels, big and small, and in cases where people own their own masters, them. Um, so uh, gotcha. anyway, so, so that's, that is what they are up to. Um, it's part of what they are up to. Uh, this last year, they um, they uh, put their toe into a um, different set of waters. Um, I'm pleased to say I sort of talked them into this, but they, um, on their behalf, I filed comments to the Federal Communications Commission um, in the Federal Communications Commission's review of local radio station ownership caps. So basically the, the AMFM lobby, the National Association of Broadcasters, if mm -hmm. they had their way, would allow for further consolidation at local market levels of AMFM stations. So where you have a maximum in one market of eight stations right now split between say, um, 5 FM and 3 AM. Instead, if the NAB had its way, you could have as many as 10 or more all FM stations in one market owned by the same entity. So mm. far more consolidation than there already has been. And in Music First's view and my view, and also their co-filer organization, awesome organization called the Future of Music Coalition, um, you yep. know, we argued that that's a really bad idea and we need to keep the limits on AMFM ownership exactly as they are right now. That's super interesting. Yeah. Um, so, look, we could talk with you for hours and hours, and, and I hope you'll come back and talk to us uh, again because these insights are so interesting. Tell, tell our, our listeners and viewers, where, where can they find you? Are you um, I, I know you have a, a beautiful website. I was reading some things on that, um, and that is rmslawoffices.com. Is that right? That's the place, yes. rmslawoffices.com. Are you on Twitter? Are you... Uh, do you like to use Twitter or any other socials? I am, to... I am on Twitter. Um, I am on Instagram, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> Rachel Photos Today. And um, and on Twitter, it's Rachel M. Stillwell. Okay. Okay. Well, listen, this has been super, super interesting. Thank you so much for taking the Thank time. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, you know, I feel like uh, I've just been taken to school. I need to kind of go through my notes now. But we, 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 th th this was like, this was like music law 101. This is just the very basics. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then we can always do another session anytime. Uh, I would love that, Rachel. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. All right. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. That was fascinating. I, mean, I, 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 I myself personally needed a really good basic tutorial on what all of these are. Right. Because as I said, I, I went and sat in on a panel on the, the MMA um, at the West Coast Songwriters Conference. And, you know, these three lawyers were bringing up so much stuff and getting so deep into right. it. And I'm just like, wow, this is just 
yeah. mind exploding. What's going on here? Yeah. And you know, what does this mean to unknown artists who's going to send their music to everybody via tune chorus? And that's the bottom line: is what does this mean for the average Joe? Yeah. Because if you dig into it. You know, there's a lot of minutiae in there. There's a lot of you know, things that people are for and people are against. And like Rachel said, this is a compromise. It's, a compromise. This, it's not that one person got their way. So there are going to be some pros and cons and not everybody's going to be for it. But in general, it, it sounds like it was long overdue and it's going to be very beneficial uh, to the uh, creators. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and 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 the case act sounds the same way. I mean, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the whole concept of what's the value if the responding yeah. party can just that ignore was my it only question and too. it goes away. I'm and and, yeah. and 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 maybe this is a huge misconception I've got, and somebody will correct me. But you know, I always remember hearing, well, if you got a speeding ticket, and you go to traffic court, and the police officer doesn't show up. That's right. It. It's ruled in they your favor because they didn't show up. It's not yeah. just dismissed. Yeah. It, you know, it feels like to me that yeah. was I'm part of the case act was part of a compromise that was made that might not have been the best compromise on behalf of the copyright holder. Yeah, I'm with you, Michael. I don't fully understand that. I do get that there are some other things that could be of benefit. And I also the fact that I can do it without an attorney. That sure. I, can I just think go that's online. great. I mean, that's I, I, amazing. Overall, the whole concept is great that you can just file a, a report, a claim. It's done remotely. You don't need a lawyer. Yeah, go for it. Uh, and then just, there's a public record of that. I think that's important. But I'm with you. You know, it's that feels it's like too a bad glaring that, loophole to me. <laughs> yeah, I. Yeah, I'm not I'm not wrapping my head around that. But, you know, listen, Rachel has great experience with, you know, working with, you know, contracts for artists and uh, not just music, you know, with other creators, yep. you know, like photographers, for example. And um, I would love to have her on again. I mean, there, I could sit and talk to her for hours. Yeah, that that was that was awesome. So hopefully everyone listening and watching, you learned a little nugget out of all of this yeah. i know i sure did i sure did. um you know as always we would greatly appreciate it if you head over to itunes and leave us a review and a rating it helps us get more exposure and if you're watching on youtube please click that little subscribe button so you never miss another episode appreciate and, it and uh that's it music biz weekly podcast we're out of here till next week <laughs>